Since the death of the non-aving dinosaurs, various titles of the biggest in certain niche here has largely gone to the mammals that dominated the land afterwards. But one animal has served as one of the very few that has taken the cake as one of the largest non-mammalian terrestrial carnivores to exist, and it is pretty insane. During the Cenozoic era, there was one group of crocodilians that went against the grain and not only survived but thrived as fully terrestrial carnivores. This group is known as the Sebecids, of which the largest and most formidable was Barinosuchus. Barinosuchus was first described back in 2007 when a snout was recovered from a formation in Barinas, Venezuela, given the animal its namesake. Since then, other scant material has been found in Argentina and Peru, but none of these specimens show any postcranial material. Thankfully, many other Sebecids. Sebecids? Sebecids? I don't know, I read these names a lot more than I hear them, so let me know how to pronounce it. The Sebecids are known and all shared pretty similar body plans, so it's highly unlikely that Barinosuchus didn't have this same body plan. The body of this predator would have been vaguely similar to other crocodilians, with the main difference with modern counterparts being that their longer legs were held underneath them making traversing land efficiently at speed possible without as much relative effort. The known part of this animal being the skull shows a remarkably theropod-like head, being much deeper than extant crocodilians and coming complete with what is known as zyphodon teeth. Zyphodon teeth are teeth that curve backwards towards the back of the mouth, are compressed laterally and are serrated, as opposed to modern crocodilians which have no serrations and are much more conical in shape. Think steak knife for cutting meat and spear for catching something. Not only that, but the total estimated size of this skull is around the same size as Displetosaurus. Now this shouldn't come as much as a surprise considering that it spent all of its time on land, but we will get into hunting strategy soon enough. Now when we put that head and estimated body together, we get a total length of around 6 meters or 20 feet long, making Barinosuchus the largest known to Beckett. This length would make it heavier than all the others, but the incomplete nature of these remains does make it difficult to give a weight estimate falling somewhere between 1,610 to 1,720 kilograms, or 3,549 to 3,792 pounds, close in size to your average Allosaurus. Now, this doesn't just make Barinosuchus the largest Sebecid, it actually makes it one of the largest terrestrial predators of the entire Cenozoic era. The size wasn't the only intimidating part of this predator either. That deeper skull actually allowed for much larger muscle attachments, namely those associated with biting. Now an exact bite force has unfortunately not been given, but if it was comparable to the similarly sized and shaped Saurosuchus, it could be anywhere within the realm of 1,000 to 2,000 newtons, which is certainly not to be sniffed at. But next, let's take a look at the kind of environment that Barinosuchus inhabited. Barinosuchus lived within the Argentina and Venezuela regions between the mid-Eocene 42.2 million years ago and the mid-Miocene 11.8 million years ago covering a wide range across South America for a staggering 30 million years. During this time, much of South America was covered in rainforests, swamps, and large sprawling wetlands, not seeing a huge amount of seasonality for much of the Cenozoic. The hotter global climate for most of the Cenozoic following the KPG mass extinction meant that most reptiles in general were giving mammals a good run for their money, but South America in particular was pretty unique. Much like Australia, this continent was isolated from all other land masses right up until the Pleistocene, so the terrestrial life here evolved some very unique fauna. Now given the insane time span of 30 million years, the number of animals that coexisted with this genus is pretty high, though not all necessarily at the same time. Along with some pretty standard invertebrates and freshwater fish and amphibians, there were reptiles such as more aquatic crocodilians, like the giant caimans Morosuchus and Purosaurus, the massive Gryposuchus, the giant turtle Stupendomys, and countless mammals varying from undulates, marsupials, sloths, and glyptodonts, just to name a few. Believe it or not, other Sebecids lived alongside it, such as Ilchinea and Langstonia, though it's doubtful that Barinosuchus had much to worry about in the way of competition. Now as to how it hunted all these animals, there are two schools of thought. Due to the slow metabolism, ectothermic animals such as reptiles tend to favour ambush predation, due to being only capable of short bursts of speed and power. Given that Barinosuchus, like all modern crocodilians, was most likely cold-blooded, many feel this would have been its approach. But we do have to remember those legs, which are clearly built for effective locomotion on land. Now, to be honest, as I mentioned in the Q&A segment of my Beelzebufo video, 
ambush versus pursuit predation isn't really an either or situation and more of a sliding scale. Personally, I don't think the Barunasuchus necessarily had the endurance for pursuit hunting to the same degree as many mammals do, but those long legs weren't for nothing, so it must have had enough speed and power to chase something down just enough after leaping from cover. Either way, Barunasuchus did not last forever and we eventually see the last of this behemoth 11.8 million years ago. Its extinction is thought to have been caused by two main factors. Firstly, there was a lot of uplift in South America during this time, making drainage of the many areas very high and drying them out. Secondly, this is around the time that Earth entered a cooling stage, preceding the most recent ice age. As the climate in general cools, exacerbated by the now higher altitudes of these areas, cold-blooded animals such as Barinosuchus simply couldn't handle it. So the astoundingly long reign of a reptilian king finally came to a close. So with that out of the way, it is now time to answer today's question, which comes from Skipodoop5197, who's us. Aside from what we've discovered, what other truly giant land arthropods could have existed during the Carboniferous? Okay, so I love this question because the possibilities here are endless, and here's why. Firstly, land arthropods really have the cards stacked against them when it comes to preservation, much more than that of vertebrates or marine organisms. So the odds are that there were things existing that we may never know about are much higher than normal. Secondly, the large arthropods that we do know of didn't get that way under really specific circumstances. For those who don't know, the Carboniferous was a time during which the oxygen content of the atmosphere was around a third higher than it is today. The reason that there were griffin flies the size of hawks and millipedes the size of surfboards is all to do with how they breathe. Arthropods don't actually have lungs, or even breathe through their mouths. Instead, they have tiny holes all over their bodies that lead into a tunnel network that delivers oxygen to where it needs to go. Through experiments done by varying the oxygen content for cockroaches as they grew to full size, it was found that when the oxygen is higher, that abundance means that the distance it has to travel without the help of blood doesn't really matter that much, meaning they're not as limited at growing bigger. So any arthropod on land could have had the potential to grow giant, technically. The only thing standing in their way was predation and competition. Having said that, competition and predation on land was not as prevalent as it would later become, since fauna was still, well, finding its feet on land. This meant that many empty and brand new niches were just waiting to be filled, which is a really accommodating scenario when it comes to attaining huge sizes. In short, within the constraints of the known groups at the time, those being certain myriapods, arachnids, paleodictyopteroids, dictyopteroids, protorthopterids, and syntonopteroidia, the possibilities are pretty large for giant members of these groups to have existed. Uh, that was a good question actually, thank you so much for submitting it, and if you have a question that you'd like me to answer, be sure that you're subscribed with the bell notifications turned on, so that you can be notified when the window opens of when I'm taking questions. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you guys next time.